This video will be about this book, Left to Tell, Discovering God Amidst the Rwandan Holocaust, by Immaculate Ilibagiza, and she's a Tutsi survivor of the 1994 Rwandan genocide, where between 800,000 and 1 million people were killed in three months. And my focus will be on the aspect that's mentioned in the subtitle, Discovering God Amidst the Holocaust. I'll be discussing three topics. First, how Immaculate credits her survival not only to her faith in God, but to God's specific protection of her. Uh, second, the implications of this kind of belief system. Because if you believe that there's a God, and that this God sometimes intervenes in the world to protect people, that brings up the matter of trying to fathom this God's priorities. That is, when it comes to things like protection from being hacked to death by machete-wielding angry mobs. Why does God protect some people, but not others? And third, I'm going to discuss some of the pros and cons of this type of belief, including the idea that God can inspire forgiveness. For the limited purpose of this video, I won't go into any of the history of what led to the Rwandan Holocaust. I'll just briefly go over what happened to Immaculate. She's in Rwanda during the three months of the Civil War slash genocide of the Tutsis, when Hutu militia groups are killing every Tutsi they can find. And the government is supporting it, and everyday civilians join the killing too. And neighbors are hunting down neighbors with machetes. And radio stations are promoting the genocide, reminding the militants to not forget the women and children, saying that all Tutsis are cockroaches, regardless of gender or age, and they all need to be exterminated. Uh, and in addition to killing Tutsis, militant Hutus are killing Hutus, uh, fellow Hutus who are not militant. Uh, that is, Hutus who are deemed too pro-peace or too politically moderate or who are suspected of protecting Tutsis or having too much sympathy for them. Every one of Immaculate's family members who are in Rwanda at the time are murdered. Her parents, grandparents, brothers, etc. But Immaculate survives by hiding with seven other Tutsi women in a tiny three-by-four-foot bathroom in the house of a moderate Hutu pastor. And the pastor, of course, is risking his own life by protecting these women. And the women have to hide there in silence because right outside the house they can hear the Hutu militants hunting for uh, Tutsis and hear them slash the neighbors to death, hear the screams, and the Hutu militants even come inside the pastor's house to search it. And the only reason they don't find the women is because a large wardrobe is covering up the bathroom door. And none of the Hutus think of moving the wardrobe to see if there's a room behind it. Now this book's subtitle of Discovering God Amidst the Rwandan Holocaust is appropriate because Immaculate writes of God throughout the book. One of the ways that her belief in God is deepened is that she finds that her finds that her faith allows her something of a spiritual escape from all the physical terror around her. Uh, on page 95, for example, she writes, I entered my special place through prayer. It was my sacred garden where I spoke with God, meditated on his words, and nurtured my spiritual self. When I meditated, I touched the source of my faith and strengthened the core of my soul. While horror swirled around me, I found refuge in a world that became more welcoming and wonderful with each visit. Even as my body shriveled, my soul was nourished through my deepening relationship with God. I should note here that she mentions her body shriveling because she went from 115 pounds down to 65 pounds. And she's not a child either, she's 22 at the time. Okay, in addition to finding that her religious beliefs offer her a meditative type of escape, she also sees God as taking an active and protective role. Uh, one example is some of the select aspects about the pastor's house. She credits God for taking certain steps to better prepare for the horrors that lay ahead like the way God must have inspired the architect to put in the extra bathroom, and, God, uh, and that God must have prompted, prompted the pastor to buy a wardrobe with the right dimensions to hide the bathroom door. She also sees input from God when she first goes into hiding and asks the pastor to push the wardrobe in front of the bathroom door. Uh, for example, on page 93, she writes, I thanked God for saving us and for giving me the idea to put the wardrobe in front of the bathroom door. That was so smart of you, God. She also sees God's protection at work in the rug beneath the wardrobe. On page 83, she writes, There was a rug beneath the wardrobe that muffled the sound of the movement. So again, God was looking out for us. So now I'm going to move on to discuss one of the consequences of the belief that there is a God and that this God sometimes intervenes in the world to protect people. And that's the, con that's the consequence of trying to fathom this God's priorities when it comes to who gets protected and who doesn't and examples of God's lack of protection abound in Rwanda at the time. 
Page 93 of Immaculate's book uh, contains a vivid contrast between a situation where Immaculate sees, God's, sees God taking a hands-on approach versus her description of a scene where God apparently is taking the hands-off approach. It's on the top of page 93 that she thanks God for having the foresight to inspire her to put the wardrobe in front of the bathroom door. And at the bottom of that same page, she includes a description of what she hears going on outside the house. One night I heard screaming not far from the house, and then a baby crying. The killers must have slain the mother and left her infant to die in the road. The child wailed all night. By morning, its cries were feeble and sporadic, and by nightfall, it was silent. I heard dogs snarling nearby and shivered as I thought about how that baby's life had ended. I'm going to read one more quote as an example of God's inaction, or our alleged God's inaction, and this is from a traveler who comes to the pastor's house and describes what it was like driving down one of Rwanda's main roads. This quote is from page 110, and I just need to give a heads-up warning for sensitive viewers, because as I read this quote, I'm going to show some graphic images from Rwanda, 1994. There were so many corpses, and they were stacked so high that we thought we were passing by piles of old clothes and garbage. But when we looked closer and rolled down the window, we knew. We could hear the buzz of the flies over the sound of the car engine, and there were hundreds of dogs eating the bodies, fighting over body parts. The whole country reeks of rotting flesh. So if I were a theist, and the type of theist that believed in a god that at least sometimes intervened in the world, and if I were a Tutsi or a moderate Hutu in Rwanda at the time, and in hiding with Immaculate, I would think I would say things to her like, okay, I suppose I should be grateful to God because thanks to his omniscience, he knew that machete-wielding gangs would be bludgeoning an average of 10,000 men and women and toddlers and babies per day. And because of this knowledge, God flexed his omnipotence by making sure we have a little room to hide in and making sure the wardrobe has the right dimensions to hide the room and that the wardrobe has a noise-absorbing rug beneath it. But still, if this is a God that has omnipotence in his pocket, isn't this something of an underreaction? By way of a scaled-down analogy, suppose you were a five-year-old in a kindergarten class and the class was being terrorized by a mentally deranged, violent ten-year-old who was running around with a spiked bat, beating all the little kids bloody, uh, beating them to death, in fact, and your large, powerful, heavyweight boxing champion father was nearby. Would you praise that father for his loving care if his only hands-on action was to direct you and a small number of your classmates to a little place to hide in, while the rest of your classmates were screaming in terror, getting their brains bashed in. Wouldn't you expect this powerful father to take his protective care up to the next level? Maybe protect the whole class instead of just a few. Maybe take away the spiked bat, or take some other type of appropriate action with the violent 10-year-old. But if this powerful father did nothing other than save a small percentage of the class, and did so in ways that still subjected the saved children to terror and near starvation, wouldn't you think this father is doing far too little for far too few? Wouldn't your mind contain the persistent question of what the fuck? Now, Immaculate doesn't, pre uh, doesn't present the situation like I am. She never puts things in terms of God taking the hands-on approach versus the hands-off approach. And when she does see God taking hands-on action, she never questions the scope. And she never says, God, what the fuck? Um, instead, anytime something good happens, she'll thank God for it, from life-saving things like helping her keep hidden from the Hutu militia, and for relatively minor things, too, like when she later applies for a job with the United Nations, she thanks God for helping her get the job by guiding her fingers during the typing test, uh, and that's on page 190. Um, but when anything bad happens, she just doesn't bring the matter up of why God is doing so little. Um, also, when I say bad, I don't mean things that are temporarily painful but can teach valuable life lessons. Uh, by bad, I mean the kind of gruesome and terror-filled so-called lessons in which uh, most of the students are dead by the time class is over. Anyway, instead of questioning why God does so little for so few, Immaculate turns her focus to, one, uh, to what one might call the positive side of being murdered, in the sense that the dead victims are now in peace in heaven. For example, after describing the baby that cries in the road until it's eaten by dogs, she soon hears God's voice in her head telling her, the baby is with me now. And later when she realizes that almost everyone in her family has been killed, and killed in horrible ways, she has a dream in which Jesus speaks to her and says, don't mourn too long for your family, Immaculate. They're with me now, and they have joy. 
Uh, that's on page 111. Now, the issue of God's apparent shoulder shrug at the brutal murder of about one million Rwandans is just one of the many, many examples of the much broader issue of, uh, broader issue of what's called the problem of evil, or to be even broader, the problem of suffering. And there are many attempts by theists to reconcile the existence of suffering with their belief in a God that's all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good. And there are an equal number of rebuttals by skeptics. But I won't go into that larger subject right now, partly because that would make this video unbearably long, and partly because I'd just be repeating the arguments I made in my video series called The Problem of Suffering, The Seven Supernatural Answers Versus the One Naturalistic. So I'll just put a link in the description box to that video series. Now I'm going to move on to the third topic in this video, which is the pros and cons of believing in a God that actively intervenes in this world. The biggest advantage of this belief is that, well, whether or not it's actually true that there's a God and this God watches over you, is that this belief, at least for some people, has survival value. We could compare the benefits of this belief to the time-tested and proven therapeutic benefits of the placebo effect, that people who think they're receiving care and treatment will sometimes experience genuine therapeutic benefits, uh, whether or not the care is real or it's just placebo. This is true for sugar pill placebo medications, and it's probably also true for the belief that God is watching over you, and that however horrible things are at the moment, it will get better, and someday you will see how this momentary suffering has a purpose in the larger picture. Uh, for the placebo effect to work, of course, one has to really believe that care is being given. You can't just decide to have this belief. It has to be what you genu genuinely think is happening. As for the disadvantages of believing in an interventionalist God, one potential problem is what's called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is that unpleasant feeling we get when we come across evidence that clashes with our beliefs about the world. So if you believe that there's an omnipotent God, and this is a loving God that cares about creature suffering, and this loving, omnipotent God sometimes takes a hands-on approach and uses his supernatural powers to protect the innocent, you might feel that those beliefs clash with real-world facts and observations. And this is especially true when children die under miserable conditions, wasting away from disease or being terrorized and murdered. Because when the victims are adults, defenders of religion can often rationalize at why the victims somehow deserve punishment. And whenever victims survive, defenders of religion can rationalize about valuable life lessons learned. But when the victims are too young to be guilty of anything, uh, and any so-called lessons just kill the students, it's more difficult to come up with rationalizations about how suffering of this sort is beneficial in the big picture. Um, it's not impossible to rationalize. Uh, apologists still do it. But it is more difficult. All right, anyway, when Christian friends of mine mention instances in which they claim that God helped them with their careers or with their girlfriends or boyfriends, I will sometimes ask them, uh, that is, if they're the kind of people I can talk to about this, how they reconcile their belief that God takes action in so many ways in their day-to-day middle-class lives, but God takes no apparent action when it comes to the likes of we'll say the roughly two million children under the age of five every year who suffer horribly and then die from conditions like dehydration from diarrhea. And the response I usually get is that they say they really cannot reconcile it. They usually admit they just don't understand. Probably the most common attempt at an explanation is that, well, his ways are not our ways. Uh, maybe we shouldn't expect that we can understand the mind of God. And the second most common attempt at an explanation is that, well, we're all going to die anyway. And even if things seem unfair now, everything will somehow even out in heaven. If I were a theist, I can't picture being satisfied with either of those explanations or any other I've come across. And when it comes to the, the defense that none of our earthly woes will even matter once we get to heaven, I would like to think I'd be skeptical of the promise that heaven is the place where God gets everything right according to human standards. Because after all, our present world is the only example we have so far of our alleged God's handiwork. And here on earth, this omniscient wisdom's grand plan includes the likes of malaria and tsunamis and a wildlife setup where survival depends on animals eating each other alive and giving human nature the capability to de dehumanize and butcher each other. Now, Maybe these things really are for the greater good in a, in a picture bigger than our finite minds can comprehend. But maybe the same principle holds true in heaven. Maybe there will be things in heaven that the human finite brain will also comprehend as horrific. But again, that's only according to our finite minds. 
So really, who's to say our lack of understanding of God's mysterious ways will be limited to earthly experiences only? I think if I did believe in a God, it would have to be the type of God who didn't intervene. A God that was maybe responsible for the creation of the universe and for turning non-life into life. But other than that, I would think the only way I could make sense of observations is that this God must take the hands-off approach at all times. So if I saw that a tornado or earthquake or tsunami destroyed a city and 90% of its population died, I don't think I'd see God as taking the hands-on approach toward the 10% that lived. My guess is that my perspective would be that this God designed a planet that's indifferent to creature suffering, and the design includes natural disasters. And sometimes they hit unpopulated areas and don't hurt anyone. Sometimes they hit populated areas and kill either a small or large percentage of the people living there. But just because 100% of natural disasters don't kill 100% of the people in 100% of the areas they strike, I don't think I could see that as qualifying as evidence of God being actively merciful wherever there are survivors. And the same principle holds when it comes to God's design of giving human nature the potential for horrendous brutality. The brutality will sometimes surface and sometimes express itself through genocide in which aggressors succeed in killing either a small or large percentage of the victims. In the case of Rwanda in 1994, I've read that approximately 75% of the Tutsi men, women, and children were murdered. So if I were a theist, I don't think I could point to the 25% who survived and say, look, God protects his children. Or I don't think I could enthusiastically praise this God for protecting some of his children. Anyway, I'm probably off base about how I would think if I were a theist, because probably my atheist biases are seeping into this analysis here. Uh, because I have to admit that most of the Christians I speak with are not bothered by aspects of their belief that they don't understand. Most just seem satisfied with the comfort they get by seeing God is active in their own lives, and, and well, that's, that's as far as most of them take it. In Immaculate uh, Illibigiza's book, I never sense that her religious beliefs bring her any cognitive dissonance. dissonance. Uh, she certainly experiences terror and despair and great sorrow, but she doesn't look at things from the broad philosophical perspective of asking, if the creator of everything is omnipotent and benign, well, how is this happening? Instead, as I mentioned earlier, Immaculate sees God as responsible only for good things, and she never questions why the scope of these good things is so limited. Uh, so she'll thank God that one of her brothers was out of the country at the time and survived, and as for her other brothers and her parents and grandparents and most of her friends, all of whom were murdered, um, well, she's grateful to God for bringing them joy in heaven. I'm going to go on just a brief tangent from the topic of believing in an active God, and mention that another thing that worked in Immaculate's favor is that not all Tutsis relied on a god that was active. The armed Tutsi rebel group called the Rwandan Patriotic Front ended the genocide by defeating the Hutus on the battlefield, overthrowing the extremists in the Hutu government, and setting up a coalition government of Tutsis and moderate Hutus. And this coalition government took steps to prevent civil wars in the future. It's now illegal in Rwanda to discriminate based on ethnicity or race, and the government identity cards no longer label people as Hutu or Tutsi, and the government has even passed laws prohibiting emphasis on people as Hutu or Tutsi. Uh, they want people to refer to themselves as just Rwandans. All right, back to the main topic of this video. I acknowledge that the belief in an interventionalist God does have survival value, and the ability to survive, or at least to survive long enough to pass on your genes, is just much higher on the totem pole than puny things like being able to defend your ideas with philosophical coherence. I'm going to close with a subtopic on the belief in an act of God, and that's the belief that this God wants people to be able to forgive each other. Um, now, religion is a double-edged sword in this respect, because religion definitely uh, has been used as justification for lack of forgiveness, and for intolerance, and for the mass slaughter of those who don't have the so-called correct belief. And the Judeo-Christian Bible has plenty of passages that directly support hatred and violence toward those not in your tribe, or those whose beliefs differ from your own. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6 says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 through 10. If anyone secretly entices you, even if it is your brother or your son or daughter or the wife you embrace, saying, let us go worship other gods. Show them no pity or compassion and do not shield them, 
but you shall surely kill them. Your own hand shall be first against them to execute them. Stone them to death for trying to turn you away from the Lord your God. But on the other hand, you can also find biblical passages about ending the vicious cycle of violence by forgiving your enemies. And in that respect, Immaculate Ilbegiza has become a great role model, especially because she's gained a degree of fame from her writing and TV interviews and other speaking engagements. And one of her main focuses in her books and public appearances is on forgiveness of the killers as a way to help Rwanda toward a path of healing itself in a way that peace can last. I'll read one of Immaculate's passages on forgiveness. Uh, this is from page 94 when she's still in hiding and asking God how she could possibly forgive people who are committing such atrocities. And she hears God's voice tell her, you are all my children. And she goes on to write, in God's eyes, the killers were part of his family, deserving of love and forgiveness. I knew that I couldn't ask God to love me if I were unwilling to love his children. At that moment, I prayed for the killers, for their sins to be forgiven. I prayed that God would lead them to recognize the horrific error of their ways before their life on earth ended before they were called to account for their mortal sins. I asked God to help me, and again I heard his voice, forgive them, they know not what they do. I took a crucial step toward forgiving the killers that day. My anger was draining from me. I opened my heart to God, and he touched it with his infinite love. For the first time, I pitied the killers. I asked God to forgive their sins and turn their souls toward his beautiful light. Now, even without belief in a God, it's self-evident that there's survival value in being able to forgive people and stop a vicious cycle of violence. It's just so much easier said than done, given that when people have been violently wronged, it's just very much human nature to want vengeance. And vengeance is often sloppy in that it often inflicts damage that extends beyond the intended party. So then everyone who gets hurt during the vengeance process in turn wants vengeance of their own, and so it goes. Uh, this is, of course, an ancient problem, and looking to the supernatural world to help end the vicious cycle of violence is ancient, too. And uh, it's, in fact, how one of the world's most ancient stories ends, and that's the Odyssey, which is estimated to be some 3,000 years old, or at least the oral version of it. In the Odyssey, the king Odysseus is gone from his home for 10 years because of the Trojan War, and many people assume he's dead. So when he finally returns, he finds that his home is overrun with uh, suitors hitting on his wife and also living in his home and eating all his food. Uh, Odysseus, Odysseus is outraged at this display of disrespect toward himself and his property and his wife, and he goes on a rampage and kills all the suitors. Uh, then the relatives of the dead, in turn, are outraged at Odysseus for overreacting. A man whose son is one of the killed people um, speaks before a large group of grieving relatives, and he calls for vengeance, saying it would be better to die in battle then do nothing. The father is described as weeping bitterly as he says, it will be an everlasting disgrace to us if we do not avenge the murder of our sons and brothers. For my own part, I should have no more pleasure in life, but would rather die. So the angry mob gathers their swords and their spears and their armor, and Odysseus discovers that they're coming, and because he's the king, he's infuriated by their rebelliousness. So he prepares his own men for battle, including his son Telemachus. And he tells his son, Telemachus, now that you're about to fight in an engagement which will show every man's mettle, be sure not to disgrace your ancestors, who are eminent for their strength and courage all the world over. And Telemachus answers, my dear father, you shall see that I am in no mind to disgrace our family. So both sides feel that their honor is at stake. Uh, both sides feel that refusing to go to battle would be a disgrace. So even though Odysseus has returned from abroad after surviving the horrors of the Trojan War, it seems that yet another cycle of bloodshed in his own hometown is about to begin. But at this point, the gods decide to step in and establish peace. Uh, Zeus tells the goddess Athena that they have to, and I quote, "...cause the men to forgive and forget the massacre of their sons and brothers." Let them all then become friends, and let peace and plenty reign. So Zeus lets his will be known, but Odysseus still doesn't listen and starts to fight anyway. Uh, but Zeus is not one to take the passive approach. Uh, he doesn't just give the grieving relatives a small room to hide in. Instead, Zeus throws down a thunderbolt as a way of telling Odysseus, don't piss me off. And with that clear-cut threat coming from Zeus, the warring parties make a peace covenant. 
Anyway, the belief that divinity takes an active role in protecting us and that divinity wants us to live in certain ways uh, can have survival value. And so long as there are people who aren't overly troubled by cognitive dissonance and who can cherry pick the right religious passages, it's not surprising that this ancient belief is still with us today. Thank you.